It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, first, uh, I, I want to uh, commend and thank the Premier for her opening uh, comments there about the tragedy, the loss of, loss of life in Ottawa with the collision today. I want to uh, well echo her comments that the, the hearts and prayers of Ontario PC members with the families, with the emergency support workers who responded quickly to the scene. I know my colleague Lisa McLeod has already raced back to her riding in, in moral support of families' impact, and I commend the Premier for her quick response on putting provincial assets to use. Thank you, Premier. Sorry, Speaker. My, my question to the Premier, Premier, is very straightforward. Later this afternoon, we're debating a resolution in the name of my colleague from Topical Lakeshore, Doug Holliday, that is calling upon the province to keep its promise to the people of Scarborough to actually build a subway according to the City of Toronto Council's wishes, which would go all the way to Shepherd Premier. Question. Are you going to keep your promise to the people of Scarborough and support the resolution today? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as the, as the leader of the, th of the opposition knows, that we are moving ahead with building a subway for the people of Scarborough, Mr. Speaker. We need to get going. There's $1.4 billion, Mr. Speaker, that we have put on the table, uh, three, an, an additional $320 million for improvements to the Kennedy Station, Mr. Speaker. So well over $1.4 billion is available. That is the money that is on the table. And, Mr. Speaker, as the leader of the opposition knows, if if there is other money that we don't know about, if the federal government, Mr. Speaker, is willing to step up, then that is a different discussion. But we are going to build the subway, Mr. Speaker, in Scarborough, $1.4 billion plus $320 million. That's real money. That money is available, and we need to get moving. Thank you. Supplementary. Um, well, back to the, uh, the, the Premier. I mean, quite frankly, Premier, you're, you're breaking a campaign promise. Yeah. Uh, you were clear in the Scarborough campaign that you supported what the city had called for, which is a subway then through Scarborough Town Centre to Shepherd. You were very clear about that. That was what the TTC had asked for. That's what was supported by Karen Stintz, by Andy Byford. And then you unleashed your transportation minister to put it kindly, who has been very erratic on this file. He's attacked the mayor. He's attacked uh, Councillor Stins. He's attacked Andy Byford. I mean, he's attacked pretty well everybody under the sun Order. because nobody supports his plan. So I ask you, Premier, clearly the behaviour of your Minister of Transportation has been very erratic on this file. Don't you think that his decision to pull this plan out of his hat is erratic as well? Isn't there a better plan? And why don't you stick to what you originally said and build that subway through Scarborough Town Centre to Shepherd like you promised during the campaign? Mr. Speaker, I will just reiterate, we are committed to building the subway in Scarborough, which is what we said during the by-election, but quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, we said long before that that we were committed to building transit across the GTHA, including in Scarborough, Mr. Speaker, and that's what we will do. The Leader of the Opposition knows full well that the plan that's being put forward by the City is a $3 billion plan. There is no business plan to find the uh, additional funds to build that plan, Mr. Speaker. We are moving ahead with an affordable funded plan, Mr. Speaker, that will get a subway in Scarborough, quite frankly, in a corridor that my understanding from the Scarborough members was always intended to be a subway, it was always intended to be a subway for decades, Mr. Speaker, and so we are building that we are building subway in that corridor, Mr. Speaker. I am pleased that the Leader of the Opposition is interested in transit, but in terms of erratic support for transit, Mr. Speaker, I would say that has been what's been coming from the Opposition. Johnny Supplementary. Well, Speaker, what you're doing is you're building a white elephant, and you know it. I mean, nobody has supported this boondoggle of a plan. You're basically taking $1.4 billion, and let's be clear about what the, the standalone Murray plan is all about, the Murray Wind plan. You're going to have fewer stops. Order. You're going to condemn people to bus rides for years and years to come. You're going to end the subway at Warden Station. Nobody supports this plan. You actually, well, it's hard. To, it's not as hard to pin you down as it is Glenn Murray, who changes his ideas every single day. First, you were for LRTs, and then you were going to build a subway that the city of Toronto wanted, and now you flip flop yet again. I, I just want to make it very plain and simple. You promised something during the by-election. It was the right thing to Order. do. Why don't you actually keep your promise to go to Scarborough? You think they're from Scarborough? They should be full citizens in the city of Toronto. Do what you said. Do the right thing. Keep your promise and vote the. Thank you. You see it, please. 
You see it, please? Order. Order. I've said it enough. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think I really think that kind of language does a disservice to people in this city, Mr. Speaker. And you know, I'm I'm one of the people, Mr. Speaker, who fought tooth and nail to preserve the integrity of this city. When that member, Mr. Speaker, was sitting in a government that was determined to undermine exactly. this city, that amalgamated the city against the will of the city, Mr. Speaker, that filled in a hole in the, on Eglinton Avenue, Mr. Speaker, did not build transit, Mr. Speaker. So I'm sorry, but I do not accept the perspective of that member when it comes to uh, building transit or support for the GTHA. So, Mr. Speaker, we are building a funded line. There is money on the table, and the plans that are coming forward from the member opposite and from the city, quite frankly, at this point, Mr. Speaker, are not funded. Answer. There is $1.4 billion that we are going to use to build a subway, Mr. Speaker. If there is more money that the Leader Thank of the you. Opposition knows about, then we should hear about Thank that, you. Mr. Speaker. Questions? Leader of the Opposition. Back, um, back to the Premier, uh, Speaker. Well, Leslie Frost. John Robarts, Bill Davis, Mike Harris, all build subways, build subways on the ground, adding stations. That's the reality. That's the reality. And I, I guess the Premier wasn't listening last week, but I'll do the score again. Order. Order. Attorney General, please come to order. Thunder Bay Atacokan, come to order. I'm saying it with a straight face. Please finish. The member from Eglinton Lawrence, come to order. I'll remind my colleagues opposite of the score in the game. The number of subway stations open under PC government, 64. The number of the Liberals, absolutely zero. Now, now look, I, I know that the Liberals think that Scarborough is off on another planet somewhere. I know when the going gets tough, your Scarborough MPPs scurry Thank away you. like mice afraid to take you on. Well, I'm Thank you. Premier. Bill Davis. If, if the yelling is stopping you from hearing me say question, that's their problem. No, it wasn't. Trust me. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And there was a time in this province when progressive conservatives did build transit, Mr. Speaker. There was a time. That is not this time, Mr. Speaker, and it has not been the time for the last 20 years. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, here's what we're doing. We're investing $416 million in renewal of Toronto streetcar fleet. We're investing $600 million to build Ottawa's light rail. Ra Rail Transit. We're investing $300 million in Waterloo Region's Rapid Transit, Mr. Speaker. We're investing $870 million to extend the Young University Spadina Line, Mr. Speaker. 34 kilometres of dedicated lanes in York Region for rapid transit buses, Mr. Speaker. And the list goes on. $16.4 billion is at work right now building transit in the GTHA. That's thank you. Supplementary. Well, no, thank you, Speaker. Um, I mean, look, the, uh, I know the members from Scarborough uh, that you have in your caucus, when the going gets tough, they scurry away like mice. They're not going to stand up to you. I will stand in my place, and I will fight for the people of Scarborough, I'll fight for the people of Toronto, and will fight tooth and nail to make you actually keep your promise to build the Scarborough subway line, like you said, during the by-election campaign. Look, you've made your promises. Andy Byford. From his experience Member, with the, the London Underground, experience with order. Sydney Transit, and ex the member from Trent, the Minister of Training College and Universities, will come to order. I uh, I will hold for a moment. In some cases, I normally try to keep the clock uh, organized, and other times I won't. Thank you. Finish. Um, well, thanks. I, I hear some heckling from members of Scarborough. I wish he'd actually raise his voice in cabinet yeah. and check the keep your promise. Where were you? Maybe 
maybe, maybe he'll stand off the cabin and then show some backbone and actually try to Question. keep Thomas because you're not going to. Andy Byford, an expert, well-respected across the field. He says your plan is inviolable. Why do you think the mayor of Winnipeg knows more about transit in Toronto than Andy Byford, the TTC, or the city council? Let me Thank you very much, Mr. The uh, member from Peterborough will come to order. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you know, the people who speak for Scarborough sit in this caucus, Mr. Speaker. The people who speak for Scarborough and who have represented Scarborough and have advanced the cause for building subway in Scarborough, Mr. Speaker, sit on this side of the house, and they have been consistent. They have been consistent for years. They have said we need a subway in Scarborough. And Mr. Speaker, quite frankly, that has been the those have been the persuasive arguments that we have heard and that have moved us to this point. We are building that subway in Scarborough, Mr. Speaker. But but here's the issue. We are going to invest in uh, an economic strategy that includes investing in people, investing in infrastructure that communities need, Mr. Speaker. That includes transit in the GTHA and transit across the region and across the province, Mr. Speaker. And it means investing and supporting businesses that will help local economies to grow. That's what we're going to do, Mr. Speaker. Building transit is a fundamental part of that strategy. Well, I, I'm proud to address the weak need Liberal Scarborough caucus here. I mean, if there's one thing they've been consistent in, is their inconsistency. Last year they stood here and they voted against subways for Scarborough. Then they were the LRT champions. And then during the by-election, suddenly they were subway champions, and now they're showing the courage of field mice by scuttling away when they should be standing in their place and fighting for you to keep your promise. We'll see where they vote later today, Premier. Well, let me tell you this. I, I know that you don't like me comparing you to Premier McGuinty, but I think it's very apt. He was known as somebody who would say one thing, and then he would flip-flop and break his promise later. At least Premier McGuinty would take about a year or so to do so. You broke your promise to people of Scarborough within a matter of weeks. So please tell us you're not going to pull a McGinty. Please tell us that you're different from Dalton. Please tell us you're going to keep your promise and vote for sure. Doug Holliday's resolution in the House later today. Say it in so stand up, keep your promise. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of our government's record on investment in transit, Mr. Speaker. From the day we came into office, we made a commitment to building transit, and we've been doing that, Mr. Speaker, across the province. And I just want to say, I really I don't believe that personal attack is necessary. I don't believe that calling names and undermining people's credibility or attempting to do that is necessary. I think we can talk about the substance of this issue, and that is building transit and moving people around the region, Mr. Speaker, without resorting to that. So I just want to say I'm not going to engage in that. But what I am, what I am going to say, Mr. Speaker, is that I was I was I had the privilege of traveling in the 680 news plane today, Mr. Speaker. I saw the congestion around the region. This is not about one subway line. This is about building transit, which we are doing and continuing to do the work that we've been doing for the last 10 years, investing in transit across the region and across the province. It will help people in their day-to-day -day lives, Mr. Speaker. Continues, there will be people not out of a job but out of the house. No, not really. It's the uh, my desire for it to rise, not lower. Leader of the third party, please. Thank you, Speaker. I uh, want to uh, begin by. Um sharing the condolences and the thoughts and prayers on behalf of New Democrats uh, uh, for the families, the victims, uh, the staff, all of the people involved in the tragedy that occurred in Ottawa this morning, and we, uh, uh, we are hopeful that uh, the community will overcome this uh, tragedy, tragedy in, a, in a way that uh, gets them through it. It's, it's quite a serious matter. Uh, speaker, um, my question uh, is for the Premier. My question is for the Premier. Will the Premier agree? to oh. unanimous consent so that we can open up the scope of the gas plants committee. Yeah.
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I believe that there is a discussion going on among the House leaders right now, and I, uh, I, I'll, let the, um, I'll let the government House leader respond in the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier refused to answer this question last week, and she said opening up the scope of the committee is a discussion that needs to happen amongst the House leader, which she just repeated again. Well, that discussion amongst the House leader speakers, Speaker has happened, but answers haven't happened. Will the Premier agree to open up the scope of the gas plant committee so we can ask about attempts by Liberal insiders to influence the Speaker, or will she keep protecting people like the Liberal campaign director and senior Liberal staffers? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed. I, uh, I think the tradition of this House is that uh, negotiations between House leaders happen at House leaders' meetings. But if the uh, member of the third party wishes to get into it, she is absolutely wrong, Mr. Speaker, in standing here today and saying no answers have been given. In fact, answers were given, Mr. Speaker, through your ruling. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let's review the facts. I think all members of this legislature were concerned about the email exchange that came out this summer. We were concerned about the committee's ruling, and uh, we looked at potential ways forward, Mr. Speaker, around the scope of the committee, or as the uh, Honourable House Leader of the PC Party decided, to go ahead with a point of privilege. And Mr. Speaker, that point of privilege was very clear on a number of points. First of all, that you were not intimidated, yes, and second of all, that no attempt was made, Mr. Speaker, to intimidate you. So when we're taking a look, Mr. Speaker, now at the question around the scope of the Thank committee, you. I think we have to look at it. Thank you. Stop the clock, please. I, um, I've tried to be as delicate and uh, uh, understanding as possible when it comes to questions in the House, particularly in this particular instance, it has come up again, albeit uh, from an original general idea. What you see happening now is that you're getting responses and questions geared to a decision that's already been made in this House, and I'm asking that it be avoided. It is not good for us, not here in this House today, but in the overall tenor of the place and the overall history of what could go on in the future. So I'm asking members to be very sensitive to asking questions about a ruling that's already been made to prevent the discussion that's happening. So I'm going to continue, and I would ask the leader of the third party to ask her uh, final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, the Premier passed the buck for opening the scope of the Gas Plants Committee to her House leader. So we did our job, and we took the issue to her House leader. We asked for unanimous consent to expand the scope, of the scope of the committee, exactly what she told us to do. But, Speaker, we haven't got an answer. Mm. Now, the Premier likes to talk about openness, but when it comes time to do the right thing and open up the scope of the gas plant committee, she's as secretive as her predecessor was. Now, will the Premier keep her promise, keep her word, and back up our motion at the committee to do its job? Thank you, Governor Hulsey. You know, Mr. Speaker, we have weekly House leader meetings. We had a uh, one last week. Those discussions are usually kept confidential, but the leader of the third party wants to get into it. We had a discussion, Mr. Speaker, and we said we would continue that discussion. But the simple matter is, Mr. Speaker, and I, I, I'm aware of what you've said, but Mr. Speaker, your wording was very clear of what happened in that meeting, Mr. Speaker, and what the New Democratic Party seems to be asking, Mr. Speaker, is that we hold hearings into an incident that never happened. And I wonder, Mr. Speaker, why the look. Uh, stop the clock, please. Um, I, I thought I was pretty clear, but here's the here's the problem. You can re-ask a question or give a different answer to accomplish the same thing as long as you stay away from the ruling. I'm asking you to avoid the discussion of the ruling. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, I think we have grave concerns that the motion that has been put forward by the New Democratic Party would do nothing to advance the work of the committee. And Mr. Speaker, I am not going to reference your, the specifics of your ruling, but in light of, especially in light of your ruling, Mr. Speaker, and I trust that that is in order. New question, the leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. People actually want to trust 
their government, and they want it to keep its promises. They hear Premier talk about fairness. Instead, this is what they see. They see her considering new taxes and tolls of up to $1,000 per family, while at the same time she's moving ahead with a tax loophole that will let corporations write off the HST on meals and expenses. Does the Premier think that that's fair? Hardly. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't accept the premise of the question. So uh, here's, the, here's the reality. We are committed to, and I've just had a, a series of exchanges with the Leader of the Opposition, about our commitment to building transit. And the Leader of the Third Party, I would have thought, would have been supportive of building transit in the Greater Toronto-Hamilton area and, Mr. Speaker, uh, building transit beyond. Uh, the fact is that the, the reference she's making to uh, what she's calling a loophole is not, in fact, a loophole, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Finance has, uh, has been in touch with the Federal Minister of Finance, and that is, Mr. Speaker, a separate issue, because the reality is we need transit in the Greater Toronto-Hamilton area. Successive governments have not built transit. We have been building transit, and we need to continue to do that if we're going to be competitive into the future. So our commitment stands. We are going to continue building the infrastructure that we need to keep our economy uh, cooking and to get it uh, to get it going. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, people have watched as this government has played game after game after game with their public transit. Minister of Transportation promised the people of Scarborough a subway, but instead of a real plan, what they've got now is a hot mess, and people are more and more concerned that they're going to be stuck with the bill. Now, does the Premier think it's fair to ask people to pay more? This is the premise of the question. Does the pre Premier think it's fair to ask people to pay more while the prov province is opening up new corporate tax loopholes? It's a matter of fairness. That's the premise of the question, Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, it is a question of fairness, and we're not opening up loophole, new loopholes, Mr. Speaker. That's just not that's just not the case. And what is not fair, Mr. Speaker, is for it would be for us not to continue to build transit. It would not be fair to ignore the reality that people need options. They need to be able to get on a train or get on a bus, Mr. Speaker, or get on a light rail vehicle. They need those options in order to be able to move around the region, in order to be able to get to work in a timely way, to take their kids to school, to visit their family members. Mr. Speaker, when I was in the, uh, the 680 news plane today, what I saw was as much traffic coming in to Toronto as going out of Toronto, Mr. Speaker, because people in Brampton and people in Newmarket and people in Durham may, may work there, but they also may work in the city and vice versa. People in downtown Toronto work in the region. We need to continue building transit, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. To not to do so would not be fair. Final supplementary. Speaker, people are tired of a government that cares about holding on to power but doesn't seem to care about the people who elected them. The people of Scarborough were promised a subway. Instead, they've gotten a messy, messy fight that's going nowhere fast. The people of Ontario were, were told that the government was going to be fair, and instead the Liberals are moving ahead with corporate tax loopholes or Liberal policy that gives a break to corporations, letting them write off the HST, whatever way you want to describe it, it's the same outcome. So they're going ahead with that policy, while at the same time they're asking, asking everyday people to get ready to have to dig into their pockets and pay even more. Now, does the Premier think that that is fair? President, thank you. Premier. So, I'm just going to step back from this for one second, just say, so you know, we're talking about our transit policy. Because we have a transit policy, yeah. and we have a strategy, Mr. Speaker, and we have money on the table to build transit. What is really interesting to me is that the parties opposite have no strategy for building transit, Mr. Speaker. They have absolutely no way of telling us or the people of Ontario how they would build transit going forward, Mr. Speaker. And you know, the reality is that our costs. 
billions of dollars. Right now, there's $16.4 billion at work building transit in this province. That's because this government has made that commitment, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that without that kind of commitment, without a plan for an investment strategy going forward, without a revenue Answer. stream, we won't be able to continue building transit. And the leader of the third party to this point has put forward no strategy for building transit going forward. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. As my leader has stated, under the strong leadership of Premier Lestri Frost, John Robarts, Bill Davis and Mike Harris, Conservative governments have opened 64 subway stations. 64. Order. That'll do. It's hard to get one side when the other side chirps up when I'm trying to get quiet. Member, put your question, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I guess it's unfortunate that the uh, members opposite don't wish to really know the true history. But these gentlemen that I just mentioned, they're the true subway champions. They opened 64 subway stations. 64. Now, in the last 10 years, under Premier uh, Don McGinty and Kathleen Wynne, the Liberals have opened exactly none. They haven't opened one station. My question, Mr. Speaker, is when are you going to open the station and what's taking you so long? Mr. Speaker, the party opposite is proposing an insanity. They are proposing to abandon years of planning, a route that has not changed since Brad Duguid was a city councillor, the member for Scarborough South Centre. Mr. Speaker, we have a fully funded, completely provincially paid for subway to the Scarborough Town Centre that you voted against. Even the heckling is one thing, but props is another. That'll stop. Please. And like every other time, every other time in my in most of my adult life, when there was a fully funded subway Answer. plan ready to go to the right place, you voted against it, you opposed it, you stopped it, and you're trying to do Thank the you. same nonsense again, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, oh, Mr. Speaker, they've yet to answer the question. Yeah. I asked a simple question, when are you going to open your first subway station? You haven't given us an answer to that yet. The only thing about you that's consistent is the fact that you always change your mind and you do nothing. And then you come along and you make nonsense announcements where you've got partners and you don't include the partners. You don't even consider the fact the federal government said up until September the 30th they wouldn't be prepared to make an announcement. But you've just ignored that. The City of Toronto voted when I was on that council and I supported it to build that subway up to Shepherd, but you've ignored that as well. Now when are you going to start listening to your partners and when are you going to get a darn subway station open? <laughs> Toronto members, but the one that they do have should get out more. Mr. Speaker, there are dozens of subway stations being built right now. There are boring machines all up and down the Scarborough line. That. There are boring machines up and down Eglinton, Mr. Speaker. There are, we are now working on extending the waterfront. There is $16 billion being invested. Now, Remember we did this Bruce once Gray before, Mr. Speaker. We did this order. once before. We had a couple of governments uh, that actually started building transit. And then just at the moment, the holes were all big and the stations were open, you filled them in. As a matter of fact, the, the honorable member sat on his hands when I cancelled the Sherway extension in his own constituency. They filled in Eglinton. I like Bill Davis. John Tory wouldn't be doing this. Tim Hudak would. Yeah. Mike Harris would. And that's the kind of Tories you are. Shameful. 
I think for the, uh, the short moment that I have, and that I intend to ask you to uh, listen to what I have to say, it's unfortunate that um, we do uh, start coming to uh, personalizing uh, issues in the House, and that uh, I have been trying my best to try to elevate the debate, and I will make a simple comment. It's not within my power to force you to do something you should intrinsically be able to do yourself. New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the Premier. On June 8, 2011, my community lost two good men, two minors, Jordan Fram and Jason Chenier, in a deadly accident and still be mine in my writing. Evidence were uncovered and shared with our community that clearly showed that their deaths were preventable. A year later, in 2012, the government finally laid nine serious charges. But yesterday, we were all stunned to find out that the government had agreed to a plea bargain and dropped six serious charges. Premier, you owe it to my community to explain why did your government agree to drop six charges. Mr. Speaker, so my thoughts and prayers are with the families of, uh, of the two, uh, two people who were lost. Um, the Ministry of Labour has completed its investigation, charges laid under the Occupation and Health and Safety Act, Mr. Speaker, as the member knows. Um, a total fine of a uh, million dollars and uh, 50,000 plus 25 percent victim fine surcharge was imposed, Mr. Speaker. This is the highest uh, total fine ever levied in Ontario for uh, contraventions of the Occupation and Health and Safety Act. Mr. Speaker, protecting workers and uh, keeping them safe on the job is the Ministry of Labour's top priority. It is what they exist to do, Mr. Speaker. And uh, obviously, one worker killed on the job is is too many. And our government will continue. Continue to work hard to uh, to protect the health and safety of workers across the province. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Eleven minors have died on the job since 2007, and yesterday plea bargain is cold comfort to the families who have lost loved ones. People in Sudbury want to know who in your government agreed to this plea bargain, and why did you do it? People in Sudbury want to know. Who in your government agreed to drop those six charges, and why did you do it? Because right now, for the people in Sudbury, we really don't understand how could this have been done. And, Speaker, I don't understand either. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think I think the uh, the member opposite knows that I don't have the details of uh, of some of the specifics that she has uh, she's asked me. What I do know is that coroner's inquests are automatic, Mr. Speaker, for all mining and construction fatalities. So there will also be a coroner's inquest into these fatalities uh, uh, to follow, Mr. Speaker, so that more answers will will be available. So I think those are the kinds of those are the kinds of reviews that need to happen, Mr. Speaker. I know the Minister of Labour is working. With, uh, was working with all parties, and as I say, that coroner's inquest will follow. Thank you. New question. The member from Ajax Pickering. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment. When it comes to the issue of waste, I believe we all want to protect the environment and pass on a cleaner, healthier world for not only our children but our grandchildren. I understand that embracing individual producer responsibility for managing products at the end of their lifespan here in Ontario continues to be an ongoing discussion. Speaker, through you, can the Minister of the Environment provide the House with an update on waste management in Ontario and speak to individual producer responsibility? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the Speaker, uh, we have heard from the Environmental Commissioner. We've heard from both opposition parties, from stakeholders in the recycling system and from the public. And that we've heard that the old waste diversion framework that we inherited is fatally flawed. There's a consensus that we need a new approach to increase recycling to better protect our environment. That's why we introduced the Waste Reduction Act. The proposed act would require individual producers to be financially and environmentally accountable for recycling the goods they sell in Ontario. 
The act would be used to boost recycling in the lagging industrial, commercial, and institutional sector. The government has been carefully reviewing public and stakeholder feedback on the act and strategy since both documents were posted on the Environmental Registry on June 6 of this year. We will continue to work with producers, with municipalities, with service organizations, yes, and with other partners to make the proposed legislation even stronger. And I look forward Thank you. to uh, that input from everybody. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, my question is for the Minister of the Environment. Residents want to know that products at the end of their lifespan are being recycled. They want to be sure that their household hazardous wastes are being safely and properly treated. The current 2002 legislation has been widely criticized for being inefficient, for stifling competition by mandating recycling clusters, and for not rewarding design or recycling innovation. Speaker, through you, could the Minister of the Environment please share with the House the proposed new Waste Reduction Act would implement a new regulatory approach that transforms the municipal hazard special waste and electrical waste programs from what they are today to producer responsibility Question. incentives that deliver solid environmental performance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Should I must say, uh, the answer to the member is a resounding yes. Yes, it will bring a new approach that ends the old recycling monopoly mandated in the 2002 legislation. Yes, it will implement real, individual producer responsibility. Here, 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 here. Yes, it delivers solid environmental performance and economic efficiency. In fact, the member's, the, the member's question reflects precisely the sentiments reflected in a news release from my very good friend from Kitchener, Conestoga. Really? Ah. And I have listened to all members of this House. I have listened uh, to news. all of those who would have any direct involvement in recycling Didn't and uh, waste diversion in the province of Ontario. And, sir? and I'm looking forward with enthusiasm and optimism to strong support from my good friends of the opposition. Thank you. Question, the member from Newmarket, Aurora. Oh, here he is. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. I thought it would be Speaker, to just a few weeks ago at AMO, I listened very carefully as the Premier spoke to municipalities and committed that she would work with them in partnership on infrastructure and transit. Just a few days later, her transportation minister made an announcement about a subway plan that neither the TTC nor the City of Toronto and even her agency, Metrolink, seemed to know nothing about. I would like to know from the Premier what happened to that spirit of cooperation that she committed to at AMO, and will she agree to set that imposed plan aside and work with the City of Toronto and the TTC Question. to build a subway to Scarborough the way that it was promised? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I you know, I am so pleased to be able to work with municipalities across the province because, as the, as the member opposite knows, infrastructure investment in one part of the province looks different than in another part of the province. So the $100 million that we have put into the Roads and Bridges and Infrastructure Fund for rural and northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, will build a different kind of infrastructure so than, than the uh, light rail and the bus rapid transit and the uh, subways, Mr. Speaker, that we're building in the GTHA. But I'm, I'm surprised that the member opposite would focus on this one line because the reality is, Mr. Speaker, he knows perfectly well that York Region is in drastic need of improved transit, Mr. Speaker, and that it's very important that we move ahead. It will be impossible to build the Young Street Relief Line that's needed in order to be able to expand into York Region because that's what has to happen in order to be able to do that without a revenue stream, Mr. Speaker. So we're committed to building transit across the GTHA. Well, Speaker, the reason I'm focusing on this one line is because that is the basis of our discussion today and it is the subject of our motion this afternoon. We are wanting very much to take the Premier up on her commitment to work cooperatively with municipal partners. Well, the municipal partners in this particular case is the TTC, 
the City of Toronto. And I'm asking once again, will the Premier simply, in the spirit that she committed to work with municipalities, agree to keep the promises that the Liberal Party made, build that subway into Scarborough the way it was committed, and support our motion this afternoon? Will she do that? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And we're building the subway into Scarborough. We're building it on the same uh, route that was detailed in the big move, Mr. Speaker. We are building that subway. That commitment is strong, and it's funded. Remember, Mr. Speaker, it's funded. That $1.4 billion is accounted for. We're ready to go, and we have to get moving. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite, my guess is, and I don't know, but my guess is when he was Minister of Transportation, he knew that there was a need to build transit in the region, Mr. Speaker. My guess is that he might have advocated for transit building within his caucus, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, no one took him up on that if he did, in fact, do that, uh, that advocacy, Mr. Speaker. But we are. We are building in the region. We know how important it is for the people of Newmarket and Aurora and Richmond Hill and Oshawa and Brampton and Mississauga. We know, Mr. Speaker, how important it is that we stay on track Answer. and build the transit that ne that's necessary for this economy to thrive, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. New question. Member from London, Fanshawe. My question is to the Minister of Training and College University. Minister, students need access to good quality university programs. Students are struggling to afford the skyrocketing costs of PSC, and many simply can't afford to move away from home to attend specialized research universities. Today, a leaked government report has, has been circulated that suggests the government could be forcing universities to specialize and reduce the range of degrees they offer. Ontario universities already receive the least funding per student than any other province in Canada. This government refuses to place students at the centre of their policies. Why is this government forging ahead with plans for drastic changes without even consulting students? Thank you. Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Mr. Speaker, students are at the centre of all the decisions and all the policies we're making when it comes to our post-secondary education strategies. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I, did sit, I have been sitting down all summer with the sector, sector in a series of roundtables as we work together to go move forward and move our, our system into a, a state of competitiveness, global competitiveness. I've also been sitting down at the same time with students to talk about the very same issues. And we've had some great input from students all summer long, and we continue to respond to that input. I've said to the member that very soon, will be renouncing, announcing changes to flat fees, uh, to deferral fees, something that students have been telling us they don't believe in the current system is fair to students. Uh, we also brought in Thanks, a 30 per cent off tuition uh, uh, a program, with which is benefiting 230,000 low- and middle-income students today across this province. Mr. Speaker, it's all about listening to Thank students. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, forcing universities to specialize and reduce their graduate and undergraduate courses offerings, undergraduate course offerings wasn't part of the government consultations last year. Yet now the government is forging ahead with secret discussions with unnamed educational leaders to impose such a change. Forcing universities to specialize could reduce regional access to degree programs, undermine university autonomy, and lead to a system to have and have not universities. Will the minister stop looking for cost-saving measure measures behind closed doors and start consulting with students about the changes it's secretly considering? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure how to respond to the secret uh, meeting comments because those discussions have been known by everybody, including the media. We've been talking about the fact that we've been sitting down with the sector in roundtables to talk in detail. We're sitting down with students, and I've been, I've been talking to uh, media all summer long about these these so-called secret discussions. Mr. Speaker, anybody following education in this province knows that we're working on a differentiation policy, knows that we're working on improving credit transfers so students have an easier ability to transfer through the system from college to university, university to university, and college to college. They also know, Mr. Speaker, we're looking at important issues like online learning. These are transformational issues. They're challenging issues, but they're places 
we need to go to maintain a, our globally competitive post-secondary system, and we're going to keep working in the interests of students to ensure we continue to provide that globally competitive system. Thank you. New question, the member from Vaughan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question today, Speaker, is for the Minister of Economic Development, uh, Trade and Employment. Minister, a number of very important manufacturing and food processing companies have operations or headquarters in my community, in my riding of Vaughan. With the global recession now behind us here in Ontario, many of my constituents have come to me with questions regarding job creation and economic development opportunities. Now, I know, Speaker, that our government recognizes the strengths coming out of different parts of the province of Ontario, and we also recognize that regional economic development initiatives help to create a strong climate for our domestic businesses to succeed and grow. Speaker, through you to the minister, could the minister please provide the House with an update, one that I can take back to my constituents to let them know about what our government is doing to bolster economic development in Vaughan and around Ontario. Thank you. The Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member from Vaughan as well for this important question. Yesterday, after uh, with so many of my colleagues here in the legislature, after visiting the international plowing match, I had the privilege of uh, visiting Kitchener and Waterloo and making two important announcements, uh, totaling over $1.6 million, Mr. Speaker, which helped to create more than a 110 new jobs and protecting and sustaining nearly 500 more. Uh, these, of course, are out of the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund. I want to say, Mr. Speaker, that these, the Southwestern and the Eastern Ontario Development Funds, are among the best funds that my ministry has to support local projects, local businesses, and in fact, under Premier Wynne's leadership since February alone, these two funds have created with the private sector partners and retained nearly 7,000 jobs across the province, leveraged uh, our $26 million yes, investment so far has leveraged more than $250 million from the That's private sector. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for that uh, very informative answer and for all of his hard work on these files. It is great to know that uh, what kind of work our government has been doing over the last number of months to support sectors across the province so that, as the minister mentioned, they can leverage investment and create good, meaningful jobs. The people of Ontario have worked together to create a strong economy, which has relied on major sectors like manufacturing, like the auto sector, and recently, of course, the Premier announced renewed funding to help promote locally grown food in the agriculture sector. Speaker, through you to the minister. Could the minister please inform the House regarding what his ministry is doing to make strategic investments into these key sectors here in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, I had two important and, I have to say, highly interesting and informative visits yesterday. One was to a company called Conestoga Meat Packers in Breslau. Uh, employing 475 people, in fact, 50 of those new of those of that workforce are uh, employed because of the investment that this company has made, and with to get together with the Ontario government. He, I arrived there. There's a big sign outside saying we're hiring. They're looking at 100 100 new employees. They're going to be increasing the plant's capacity by nearly one third. They're exporting to 30 countries around the world. It's a fantastic company. And then I went down to Cambridge to Kinetics Noise Control. Fascinating company as well. We're creating jobs together in partnership with them, making this investment. Very interesting that this company actually, in the new jobs created, are producing acoustic materials, materials used in the tunnel ventilation system for the new uh, Shepherd subway line. So yes, we are building transit in Toronto, and it's creating jobs in Cambridge, Mr. Speaker. question was going to be for the Minister of Environment, but I'll go to transportation because it is transportation related. Residents in the north part of Dufferin County have been receiving letters that they are, for the first time, going to be required to complete a drive cleaning test before renewing their driver's license. My constituents have not moved, and yet they are now being asked by MTO to pay for a drive clean test because Canada Post has changed the postal codes. When I wrote on behalf of residents asking for an explanation, your ministry told me it was an oversight, that they have been exempted since the program began, and now they must pay. Minister, it appears that this decision to include them now, more than 10 years later, is simply another cash grab by your government. Are your recent postal code changes just Question. another excuse for you to squeeze more money from hardworking Ontario drivers? Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. 
Um, I, I will. Well, the first thing, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say to the member, I want to. I want to thank her for her question, and I promise I will follow up and look into the particulars of the case and appreciate that there's some frustration there with a constituent of yours, and that's the job of MPPs here, and I commend her for, for raising the issue. What we are trying to do, Mr. Speaker, is, as our other jurisdictions in Canada, and as one of the members opposite pointed out, I have some experience in one of those, is that most provinces are running to a cost recovery for automobiles. For example, my mother, who's 86, just retired. She gave up her car. It's hard to ask to put taxes on seniors to pay for things that those of us who drive cars. So when you get your driver's license or you're paying to get the air quality standards, so our kids with asthma or seniors don't have to air, Mr. Speaker, we ask people to pay a modest rather than taxing everybody. It's a cost recovery measure. It's consistent with what Thank the you. provinces and what the states are doing, and it's good policy, Mr. Speaker. Order. In case the member from Renfrew didn't hear it, I did ask him to come to order. I, yeah, just because. <laughs> Supplementary, please. Mister, this is not about cost recovery. This is about a cash grab. These people did not pay. They have not been paying. They have been exempt from the dry clean program. Suddenly, I've been working on this for three months. All I'm getting from your civil service is they must pay now. They should never have been exempt. What, are you going to go back 10 years and charge them for it? Minister, I want this solved. I want to see this decision changed. Ultimately, I would actually like the dry clean program to be eliminated because it's not done Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank the member opposite. She's doing her job as an MPP. I thank her for raising this issue. It's obviously a big province, and with 13 million people, one of our jobs in the House, Mr. Speaker, is to speak up for people who sometimes get overlooked, and I appreciate her doing that. Again, it's cost recovery. One of the things this government is also doing, because by law it has to be cost recovery, and we cannot overcharge for more than the cost of the service, and that's good and transparent. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> one of the things that my my friend, the Minister of Government Services, the Honourable John Malloy, is doing is he's working on an open data thing process so that people will actually be able to go on and see the cost of services and they'll be able to see the price and that will be completely transparent mr speaker as as we're doing so when people are mr speaker are planning transit lines or rapid transit lines they can see that for example the scarborough town center justifies a subway and some of the other options make no sense so we're all about open data and evidence mr speaker so people can see for thank themselves you. and make their own judgment thank you, you question speaker. the member from kitchener Waterloo. Waterloo. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. It's not just the people in Scarborough who are trying to figure out what this government's transit plan is. People outside of Toronto want better transit service to get to work and travel out of town. Instead, people in Kitchener-Waterloo and nearby communities have seen our VIA service cut and have been left with, the go with a GO train service that isn't meeting the transit needs of our residents. Last night, people in St. Catharines came together because their VIA service, cut is get via service is being cut. They want to know what's going to happen uh, with their transit in Niagara. What is the Premier going to do to improve transit in communities outside of the GTHA? Thank you, Minister. Premier. Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Mr. I, I want to thank the member for Kitchener-Waterloo because I know this is, again, a very s sincere question and well asked. The issue is this. The Conservatives in Ottawa, that would be our friends who, who filled in the Eglinton subway line and froze GO Transit service, also have benefited another gift, being completely consistent in their behaviour, being the contrary of their rhetoric. They cancelled half the VIA service from Kitchener-Waterloo to Toronto. A matter of fact, interestingly, there's been massive reductions on VIA service. The Ontario Liberal government, as it always does, added two trains to Kitchener. We thought we were increasing by almost 50 per cent the service to Kitchener because we realize it's important. What we didn't realize is that we were just offsetting cuts by the federal Conservatives. The same people over there that tell you they're subway champions and via champions when they get into power Answer. and have the coaster. So I regret that the people in Kitchener-Waterloo have the same service they had before. The difference is they have two more GO trains and two fewer VIA trains, and the feds cut the Thank service you. as soon as we started it. Supplementary. It's, it's
it's not, it's not just via, it's not just via service. This government promised two-way all-day go service on the line that runs to Kitchener Waterloo and Tanzania cities along the line. But while the government is picking fights over a Scarborough subway, it has delayed two two-way all-day go service for almost 15 years. The government cancelled the Ontario bus replacement program, which helps municipalities like mine without subways to maintain their bus fleets. Commuters, students, and families outside of the GTHA are wondering why their transit priorities are at the bottom of the pile. When will the Premier stop playing political games with transit and begin building transit for Ontarians who have waited long enough? Mr. Speaker, Chair Sealing, Mayor Zare are wonderful friends. They're nonpartisan during elections. They're positive folks. They pay one-third of the costs, or more sometimes, of transit in Kitchener. We pay one-third, and because it, it doesn't have a 416 area code, the federal government pays one-third, Mr. Speaker. It's a great relationship. Here in, well, on Scarborough, we're paying 100 percent of the cost, and we're building it to the only place that makes sense and the same place it's been in the plan. This is the only government that's not changing the plan. The city's changed the plan to go under single-family homes and to miss the Scarborough Town Centre. How do you build a subway to Scarborough that doesn't go to the Scarborough Town Centre, Mr. Speaker? We haven't changed anything. The lines on the map are the same. The opposition suggests the lines have changed. Clearly, they don't read budgets and they don't read maps. I think Minister, I, I should refer them to the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities for some upgrading, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. But we have added via service and I think your question, the member from Mississauga, Streetsville. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, this question is also for the Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Minister, in Western Mississauga, transit's a big issue. We need that planned capacity expansion of the third and the fourth track on the Milton Go Line. People want to leave their cars at home and they need viable transit options when they need to commute and when they need to go where they have to go to go to school or to go to work. Good transit planning and implementation is not just what you do, it's when you do it and how you do it and how you involve people in the communities along the transit corridor and in the service areas in the implementation. Ontario uses some database tools to help plan transit routes, all derived from data from our urban environment. Would the minister please describe what data our government uses to help Question. plan transit routes? Thank you, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. A matter of fact, the Ministry of Transportation, which does the work, not Metrolinx, has the richest databases, as does the Growth Secretary. I have offered all of this data to my opposition critics so they can see the same numbers I see. You will see why the Ministry of Transportation and Metrolinx said stick to the original plan and build the subway to the Scarborough Town Centre, because those data metrics in I corridor are built on two things, the big move and places to grow. And the Scarborough Town Centre is an urban growth centre. It will generate lots of ridership. We know from millions of dollars and years of planning that. The same thing in Mississauga. The Here Ontario LRT is absolutely critical to reducing congestion. When, when put through the I corridor process, it showed that it will have Answer. a lot of investment in jobs, Mr. Speaker, as well as have high ridership, as will the Eglinton Crosstown. And in closing, Mr. Speaker, we also modeled some Thank of the you. past projects. Had Thank you. Nope. Minister, member. Minister, making decisions based on how people use transit and on what their urban environment looks like now and in the future is important. So is using technology to let people have their say and to test their opinions, to test their preconceptions and theories against what reality is now and what reality will be in the unfolding future. The I-Corridor application is open to the public, and our residents in Lisgar, Meadowvale and Streetsville would like to use it. That type of involvement would keep people from supporting idiotic policies like filling in evidence-based subway lines that are already under construction. Minister, how can Ontarians use the I-Corridor application to see how government decisions on transit are actually made? They, Ms. Thank you. I, I appreciate the members both interested in transit and information technology. Right now, today, you just go click, click on the MTO site, and what cascades down is the richest source of data and open source data there, clearly available to the TTC, to developers, and to citizens to understand that. 
and to the opposition. And I met with, my, with some of my critics' office, and I offered it to them. I've actually offered that our, our staff will give them a completely independent briefing. Metrolinks is doing this. When we actually started planning the Metrolinks pro projects, we did not have the advantage of this data, Mr. Speaker. I gave a presentation this morning. So we are now improving our performance. I have said to the, to the, the members opposite, if you actually believe in evidence-based decisions based on land use, access, and ridership, take the ideas. What you'll find is the plan that was whipped out of nowhere Answer. to draw a new line, Mr. Speaker, has no ridership. It actually doesn't go to the Scarborough Town Centre. It goes under single-family homes, unless you want to tear Thank up you. upper middle-class Scarborough. Thank you. New question, the member from Simple Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is uh, for the Minister of Finance. Minister, on May 18th, three years ago, the Pension Benefits Amendment Act received royal assent after getting all party support in this House. As you know very well, this legislation is needed to help thousands of public sector employees merge their pension benefits so that they can retire with benefits they've already paid for. On March 30th, two years ago, I asked your predecessor, the Minister of Finance, why he had since ignored this bill and not introduced the necessary regulations. At that time, his response was, and I quote, we are engaged in a range of consultations. Those regulations will be promulgated shortly, end of quote. <laughs> Minister, can you stand up in the House today and tell us anything different on this issue than your predecessor told us two years ago? Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I appreciate uh, the question, and I appreciate the concern from all sides of the House when it comes to retirement planning in the province of Ontario. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons, because too many Ontarians, almost 40 per cent, don't have a pension plan or a retirement savings plan. And as a result, we instituted in our budget more recently the one, by the way, that you didn't support, which is the pool of uh, RSP plan, a PPRP and an employer plan and alternatives to try to support those Ontarians in need. And we will continue to also advocate for enhanced CPP with the federal government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Minister, I couldn't have been more fair to you. I spoke to you just after you were sworn in as Minister of Finance. I handed you a letter. I've written you five letters since last December on this issue. I've raised this in the House on several occasions. I did a private member's bill that was debated in this House and voted upon. Uh, thousands of former uh, paramedics, thousands of MPAC employees, uh, through no fault of their own in the mid-late 90s, uh, had their employer change. They might have been working for the Collingwood Hospital Ambulance Service and are now working for the County of Simcoe, so their pensions would have been merged automatically if they were police officers moving from the Collingwood Town Police to OPP because it's in the Police Act. Four years ago, your predecessor did put it in the budget. Three years ago, the, uh, it received royal assent, but we've been waiting three years. There are thousands of Question. public servants in everyone's ridings waiting to retire. This doesn't cost you any money. You simply have to transfer the money so that all the credits are put together in one pension plan Thank you. and they get the pension they paid for. What are you going to do? Mr. Speaker, um, I appreciate the enthusiasm and the spirit and the concern by the member. I do. But what is important is what has been done and what we continue to do to support those Ontarians who require support and their RSP. In fact, pension reform is underway. It's in this budget, something that you didn't support. We have it on page 276 talking about some of the requirements and some of the initiatives that are underway now. In fact, some of the work that we've done has actually been able to support and save taxpayers up to $2.4 billion this year alone while protecting pensioners. We need to ensure that a pooled pension plan Answer. exists, that all those initiatives and all those individuals have safeguards. We would support your recommendations, provided you also support what's in it, and we need your help. The member from Beaches East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question, too, is to the Minister of Finance. In April of this year, my office was contacted by Randy and Jeanette McGibbon. Randy, along with 87 other employees, was laid off when Unilever ceased to operate in, two, in 2002. The former employees have been waiting for 11 years for surplus pension funds that belong to them. As one member said, and I quote him, I hope we get our money before we die. 
The Financial Services Commission of Ontario has had this file since 2007, and nothing has happened except delay after delay. A speaker, the Minister of Finance seems to think that 11 years is a reasonable amount of time for these workers uh, uh, to wait, but my question to him, will the minister now instruct Fisco to take immediate action on this file question. so that these workers can finally receive their money 11 years after the fact? Minister Finance. Again, I appreciate the question, and I, uh, and I appreciate the concern being expressed. I will, in fact, endeavour to review exactly what the member is asking. Um, we all want what's best for those families who are impacted. We want to ensure that those that have invested do have their money. We want to ensure that those that are deserving of support receive it, and I'll look into it. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Minister on point of order. Um, as an MPP born and raised in Scarborough, I take great offence to remarks made by the PC leader earlier in question period. I, I, uh, I, I know where you're headed, please. I know where you're headed. Um, it, it's, it's not actually a, a point of order except to say that any member that says anything in this House has an opportunity and a right to correct the record if they believe they've said anything that's untoward that I myself did not uh, catch or any other member did not catch. If there was anything said in this, I'll wait. I'll provide time for any member who wants to correct their record at any time. And if there's somebody here that wants to do that now, I will be free to do so. And if not, the member from uh, Simcoe Gray on a point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to expand the scope of the Standing Committee on Justice Policy to allow questions related to the motivation and intent of Liberal staff and advisers to meet with the Speaker regarding the Speaker's finding of a prima facie case of privilege, but shall not include the Speaker's confidential discussions. The, uh, the member for Simcoe Gray has asked for unanimous consent to put forward a motion. Do we agree? I heard a no. There are no uh, the member from Cambridge is not making himself any brownie points right now. There are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 3 p.m. this afternoon.